media, or new, new ways of communicating, communication between, us, between each other, between us. And as you know, I mean, ICNC and ELSA followed it, uh, are based on essentially interdisciplinary communication. And uh, after about 20 years of trying to study the brain together and educating uh, many good scientists uh, together, I think it's about time that we should try to really communicate in the sense of uh, challenge each other. And uh, so I decided, or we decided together to start this new uh, course, seminar, forum, of uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, where uh, we'll try to bring together uh, experimentalists and theorists to have some sort of common denominator or, or common interest and actually I think in the case of uh, Ellie and, and me today, uh, it's going to be uh, maybe too common because we talk too much to each other, so it's going to be a little difficult for us to surprise each other. But uh, the idea is really to uh, really try to identify those points where experimentalists need theory and theorists uh, need new experiments. And it has uh, several goals as far as I'm concerned. First of all, it's really to, I believe that science with no theory is, is dull in some sense. It can be very rich in terms of facts and, 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 uh, and um, things to know, but as far as really making progress in what we call understanding, in the, the theory is really essential. And I think we all understand this, but at the same time, uh, neuroscience and, and brain sciences in general are founded no, on, 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 on disciplines which, are, which have no real theory in the sense that I will describe in a second. Um, although slowly getting there, but if you're asking me, biology, for example, have, has no theory. And it's theory less than science. It's not only biology, it's true for about uh, many other disciplines. It's theory less in the sense that it's hardly the case where theoretical concepts or theoretical ideas are really driving the science forward. And uh, I believe that uh, it's really driven by experiment to a large extent, and sometimes there are high-level concepts that really allow us to, to think ahead or to put, to put things in some sort of perspective, but theory per se doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned in, in biology, or at least almost. And uh, so the idea of this, uh, of this series, this experiment, is really to try to bring us together again and to really sharpen the, the boundaries and what we call the interface. And you ask me what is an interface and why interface. So interface is defined as the surface uh, forming a common boundary between adjacent regions, bodies, substance, substances, phases, or so on. Or if you want a point at which independent systems or diverse groups interrupt. And this is really, as far as I'm concerned, is really a, a good, uh, a good. Uh, name for what we're trying to achieve here. Because after all, experimentalists and, 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 and theorists are different. They're entirely different. They're different types of animals. In, in the way they think, the way they, they conceive things, the, the it's almost as bad as, as men and women. Are women are really very different. But not so bad. Well, men and women. Not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, Ellie and I agreed to be the, the first victims of this experiment. <laughs> and uh, of course, it just uh, as always, when you, when you first try things, you, you make all the possible mistakes, and I'm sure that we'll make all the possible mistakes, but the idea is somehow to establish some sort of a standard for an ongoing communication, which will eventually lead not only to new thinking, but to new ideas for PhD physicists and, and students. And this is really why we're here, and why we call it a course because we really want somehow eventually out of such a discussion to get, to get out with questions or, 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 or themes or, or, or new ways of thinking about, about the future of brain science, if you want, so the things that I, we hope the students here and in the next generations to do. So these are supposed to be, in some sense, uh, what we were trying to achieve, let's say, in this big uh, uh, future of brain science meeting that we had uh, a month ago. Really future-looking thinking, and, and, and in that sense, allow ourselves to, to 
be a little less uh, solid and, 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 uh, and careful than, than we usually are, at least, let's say Ellie usually are, <laughs> usually is. Uh, I mean, I, I, I allow myself to be very wild in my ideas all the time, but uh, anyway, but, but trying to, to somehow uh, really uh, propose visionary ideas which will lead eventually to new types of, uh, of work and new, new field utilities. So this is more or less the list that we know now of the people uh, on this uh, on this uh, course. It's, it's not going to be about once a month. And uh, so far, uh, we managed to couple more or less, uh, uh, some, some, some sort of logic, uh, the following people. Uh, if it's going to work with all of them, or it's going to work with some of them, we'll see at the end. But the, the dates of these three is not, are not fixed yet, but I'm sure that now that we advertise them, they will <laughs> immediately tell us when, when is it going to be, sometimes in the next semester. But as you see, we even just among us, and this is actually quite impressive, just among the, the LSEC and ICNC members, we managed to really cover many different types of uh, interfaces between theory and experiment. And, uh, and hopefully this will yield a lot more. And of course, if we'll uh, continue this, uh, this we will have to recruit other people from other places. OK, so before I, I uh, let Ellie, uh, so essentially the, the idea is that we try to challenge each other. I mean, I, I should uh, pose uh, a, I mean, of course, we can't expect a theory, theorist to explain experiments. <laughs> in, in, in some cases, this can happen, can happen as well. But the idea is really to challenge each other in the sense that here are some ideas that I would like to test experimentally. And at the same time, the experimentalist should tell us here are some facts that I can measure it and see clearly that I don't have any explanation. We lo would love to see a theory of So this was essentially the instruction that we gave everyone. It's not that easy. <laughs> to switch heads, I mean, to really think, uh, to take a theorist and ask him to think like an experimentalist and, and vice versa. So to some extent, I'm not sure we're going really going to do it today, because obviously we all fall back into what we know and what we talk about all the time. But still, at least through the discussion and through your questions, I hope that we will achieve it eventually. OK, so allow me just to give my own personal perspective about why do we need theory and what theory is all about. I'm sure that some of you here will uh, object to me. <laughs> so, so if I ask you, what is this? Of course, many of you know already. <laughs> so this is, uh, anybody who ever looked under the hood of, of his car, uh, this, this is uh, an engine. Okay. Uh, 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 a very, a very, uh, more or less standard uh, four piston uh, gasoline engine, so internal combustion engine. <laughs> and uh, if we just see something like this and ask you what, what is it, of course, there are many ways to go around. And, and the, the standard way is really to take it apart. <laughs> Essentially, uh, OK, look what, look what it, it is made of. And, and of course, then I, I give you a, a, a long list uh, even if you are not an engineer of design, if you are really trying to understand what it is, just but you just found something like this, have no idea what it's what it's for, and just taking it apart. And eventually, I can give you a, lo a list of hundreds of pieces, maybe thousands of pieces. Give each one of them a very fancy name, maybe in Latin if you want, and uh, and and then call myself an expert to this uh, this device or this machine. But is taking it apart really giving us any real understanding of what's going on there? So of course, uh, even if I give very long names to all the different pieces, this, this on its own will not, does not constitute what I consider, and I think most, 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 most people will consider understanding of an engine. And this is uh, more or less obvious the way I say it, but maybe even a little bit ridiculous not the way I say it, but this is precisely what biology is all about, more or less. Of course, it's not entirely true, but uh, <laughs> just breaking the pieces and trying to identify the different screws and the different nuts and so on. Oh, but in biology, you know, you take the head gasket. Uh, yeah, so eventually, eventually you call it a head gasket, okay. but you actually know what it, what it, what it does or what it. it yeah, what, if you well, what, what I'm trying to say, of course, I'm taking it to a little extreme, but eventually you need something else which will put these things together in, 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 in some organized, in some 
meaningful way which will allow us to understand that there is actually a moving piston here that is generating pressure and so on and some fuel is turning into very complicated chemistry to energy and this energy is turned into force and, 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 and mechanical work and so on and so forth. But without this higher level concept, which I just flipped through with you and some of them you know, some of them you don't know, like energy, force, uh, mechanical uh, transformation of, of heat to, 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 to force and so on, there's absolutely no way you can really understand what, what this is doing. Even if I give you a very, very long list of what it is. What I mean by that is that this way of reduction <laughs> into small pieces is definitely not enough to, to com complete what we call understanding. And of course, uh, when we look at where theory is successful, uh, I think you, you will agree with me that essentially really one example, maybe one and a half examples in science where theory is really deeply part of the story you can't really think about about these this type of sciences without, without theory, and these are essentially physics, and a few things that follow this, and, uh, and the computer science, maybe. <laughs> I was going to say maybe, because the, the computer science is too young and too avant-garde in its structure, and it's trying to do everything different. So it's really hard to say that uh, it's exactly the same type of relationship between theory and, and, and experiment in computer science as we have in physics. But in physics, I think we have 400 years of history of what theory is good for. And again, let's see what are the main achievements of theory in physics, for example. So first of all, it's the emergence of very si simple, what I call model examples, like the mathematical pendulum or the ideal gas, or the, uh, I, I like to go to, to a thermodynamics or something like the Carnot heat, heat engine cycle and so on, the things that actually are underneath uh, this understanding of en engines in general. And of course, behind, behind them, and immediately behind them, which really what constitutes the power of the theory of what we call concepts. And, and these concepts are entirely non-trivial. These are things that took hundreds of years to form. And, and in physics, I think, like, which we take for granted now, maybe like force, or like uh, mass, or like charge, or like energy, and so on. And some of these concepts are, are so difficult that it takes us years to actually teach students to understand what, what do you mean by entropy, what do you mean actually mean by temperature, and so on. And we need a lot of sophisticated language to actually explain them. But without them, and not only without them, without what we call quantitative relations between them. I mean, it's not only that we know how to define mass, although it's actually very hard to define it from first principles, just as it's very hard to define charge from first principles. If we don't really know what it is, if you really ask me all the way down in a philosophical sense, but we know how it interacts or what role it plays in some sort of quantitative relationship with other things. So we, we have equations that connect, let's say, force and mass and acceleration, or that connect charge and force and energy and so on and so forth. And those quantitative, those can be equations, they can, in, in, some, in some not so lucky cases, we only have bounds, or we have uh, uh, tendencies like entropy tends to grow in an isolated system and so on. Uh, so some of those uh, relationships are not that precise, or not always that precise. But without them, without quantitative relationship between concepts which emerge from some deeper understanding of, the, of what we see, I, I don't call it a theory. And it's actually something which really computer science uh, puts on, on, on another, another sort of type of quantification and theory. It's not enough to have equations. It has to be solvable in some sense. It has to be tractable. I mean, the fact that I can actually uh, uh, write down, uh, let's say, field equation or string theory or something like this, which will have very nice and very elegant concepts, if I can't really turn them into some sort of useful predictions, uh, in some sense useful, and computer science useless. And in some sense, computer science told us that writing the equation or <laughs> even prescribing an algorithm for calculating things is not always enough. I mean, you need to be able to, it has to be tractable in some very fundamental sense. So, these two things are really essential. I mean, some quantitative relationship and some way of solving them uh, uh, or getting some non-trivial predictions. And usually we can do it for very simple cases. I mean, only idealized in some sense. Or really si simple, simple cases. And of course, such equations are known to all of us. And I mentioned a few. And these are, these are really great, great successes of science. I mean, we, we really understand to some extent the basic laws of mechanics. Really understand this in some sense the basic laws of the 
equilibrium thermodynamics, we understand the basic laws of electromagnetism and so on. Uh, but surprisingly, the, or maybe not so surprisingly, the number of different concepts that underlie essentially all everything that we know in, in physics is, is, is extremely small. You know, we can actually list on one page all the fundamental concepts of physics with a lot of space left. And uh, even if I just, just with a little more pressure, I can even put all the equations there. With <laughs> Maybe I need another page, but not much more than that. And this is really a remarkable, a remarkable story. There's a way of actually putting everything that we understand and in a very few lines and eventually uh, get something useful out of it. But what, something we, we have to remember, I mean, moving from this very simple, very concise, very condensed way of uh, understanding our laws to what, what we may call uh, understanding complex behavior like the brain, there's hardly any, any example for this as far as I'm concerned in, in, in physics. I mean, we can't even solve exactly very, very simple physical systems like a double pendulum or, or uh, I mean, it takes, <laughs> it goes immediately to, to to, to very complex behavior which is non-tractable in, in the computational sense. So essentially we believe we understand the principles, but we don't really have a prediction and the ability to predict the behavior of com absurdly complex systems. This is, what, this, is, this is what I think. It, so we believe we understand the laws of mechanics or even the laws of quantum mechanics, but and through this we believe we understand the principles of chemistry and biochemistry and maybe a lot more than that, but we don't really we are, we, are, we are not really able to use those equations to really give you concrete predictions of any real complex system. We can approximate, we can do all sorts of useful tricks, we can take all sorts of limits, we can take all sorts of, all sorts of uh, asymptotic behavior, equilibrium behavior, and so on. But in general, those laws are not tractable for really complex behavior. Uh, by the way, I, I, I wrote here that there are clearly examples of things which are not theories in that sense, and Darwin's evolution, in my opinion, is not a theory. Very deep concept and a very useful guiding principle, but it's not a theory because it doesn't even have a, a clear quantitative uh, uh, concept that we that it has some relationship with them. But of course, we may, and like hopefully within our lifetime, lifetime even have some sort of uh, real theory that that predicts or, or fulfills Darwin's principles of evolution. It doesn't mean it doesn't have a theory. So again, this is something which I really just usually quarrel over with Idan and people like him. Uh, there's no real theory. I don't think we, we can have a, a theory of really that can in any way can give detailed prediction of any real complexity. So something like predicting how I will behave in the future is something which is not going to be achievable by any theory that I can think about. And I think this is not, not a valid goal of theory. So what we're really, what we're really after are quantitative concepts that are first of all measurable in experiments. And, and, and then, either empirically or through some analytical analysis, have some uh, quantitative relations that allow us to make new predictions. That's what, the, that, that's what I want from a theory. Okay, so again, the examples are clear. I mean, so again, the pendulum, the mathematical pendulum is, 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 a, is, a, is a very nice uh, idealized system which we more or less, or even exactly understand, but we understand it only because we are able to, to make all sorts of idealization, ignoring friction, ignoring the mass of the wire, and so many other things. And eventually have very cl clear understanding, this, this, by the way, this particular system really al led to some sort of deep concept. Essentially, in order to understand the pendulum, the simple mathematical pendulum that Galileo started to look at, we really need to form to understand the concept of force and mass and acceleration and kinetic energy and potential energy and maybe gravity and so many other things. So a lot, is, and eventually make some useful predictions like the fact that Approximately, the period of the pendulum depends only on the length of the wire and gravity, and I think. I, I like the Carnot cycle, as you know, because I believe that something like this may be useful thinking to think about the brain, and I'll come back to this later. The Carnot cycle is, is again, an, an excellent example of an idealization of this piston in the engine, <laughs> which eventually allowed us, using very simple principles like the, the, the law of the creation of gases, of ideal gases, to eventually understand something much deeper about the way heat, uh, first of all, the fact that the, the energy is some, somehow preserved, and then that it can be transferred to some sort of internal degrees of freedom that we call entropy, and so on and so forth. 
you can do it only by some sort of an abstraction, a reduction of a very complex system into a very simple, tractable uh, model that eventually allows us to, to extract some new, new concepts and, and get some new understanding. And this is precisely the kind of thing that I would like to see for the brain. That's what I am after when I talk about the brain. In other words, something like the Cronos cycle, of course it's not the Cronos cycle, but something as simple and as uh, insightful in terms of understanding the basic quantities that we will eventually be able to connect to some sort of, of a quantitative relationship. Okay. So I'll, I'll actually stop here because from here on I, 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 I of course, I'll just tell you what, what, I, call, what I consider the, the Cronos cycle of the brain, which is essentially this, this uh, st more or less quasi-static or quasi-stationary uh, equilibrium that we have with the environment. Uh, and, and, and this type of uh, model, it's really a toy model, it's almost a caricature of the brain, uh, allow us, I think, to make interesting predictions. But eventually, I, I will not go into this uh, thing, but the, the question that we pose here for this particular discussion, or my, what I call my primar primary challenge and the challenge to myself, as well as to the experimentalists, is to understand the images of what we call cognitive perceptual and behavioral hierarchies, and I'll say a little more about this later on, but I, I think this is a very good question. I think this is a question that at least I believe we can formulate, conceptualize in the sense of getting to understanding the emergence of cognitive hierarchies. It's a challenge, it's not a challenge, yeah, it's a challenge, or it's a question, it's a challenge if you want to say. What, how do they form? And in particular, what I want to focus, what we want to focus here today uh, mainly because both Ellie and, and, and I are interested in this for many, many years, and, and we think it's a very good model for a lot of other things, is to understand the auditory perception. And in particular, in this context of emerging emergence of hierarchies, we want to understand what Ellie is going to call uh, how sounds are perceived as, as, as complex things like ideas and uh, music and, and other things like this. The emergence of language. If you want one, one, one uh, question that I'm going to address later on is what really stands behind this miracle? Why did he begin to speak? And that's all how. Not so, uh, of course, the why and how are going together with it. It's different than the how. But it's really, I'm trying to understand how, well, of course, you know more or less where I'm going, but what I want to argue is that there's something very fundamental in the structure of our brain that is really this uh, chunking of objects of perceptual, concept, perceptual and, and, and behavioral, most of them may be objects that eventually allow us to, to form concepts in our brain, which are very similar to what I just said about science. I mean, we have conceptualization of higher and higher and larger and larger scales, which are eventually led to what we call language. And language is, a, is in some sense, not only a, an object of research on its own, but really a metaphor for science and, and the way we understand things in general. That is the way I think about it. And uh, I would like, in the second half of this discussion, to, to pose some concrete experimental questions that are posed by this line of ideas to people who use this language. And people connect. Okay, so I'll stop here and let Eli uh, tell us the other side of the story and then we'll change some views. I actually want to start by making a point that's not directly related to the interfaces, but rather to something that struck me uh, now in uh, in Sally's talk, and this is the fact that he showed you a picture of an engine and told you that you all know that this is an engine. So I wanted to start with this. Okay. Uh, for those who don't read French, what's written here below is that this is not a pipe. Madrid uh, painting, and the question is why is this not a pipe? And there are many reasons, but one of them is the fact that it's a painting, it's not a pipe. 
the projection of the same thing. It will get there. <laughs> <laughs> okay? So when we do an experiment, the only truth that we have is the electricity that runs in the wire to the electrode that we had uh, on, the, on the head of the subject, okay? Um, that's, uh, uh, this is, in a way, that's the fight. Okay, everything else that we do out of that is not a fight. It's uh, our interpretation of the, uh, of the data and uh, um, anything that we do, every paper that's written is actually heavily influenced by the imprecise and uh, uh, very often not explicitly formulated assumptions and ideas in the head of the experiment. Now, I'm not trying to say that science is subjective, it's not, okay? But we have to be aware of the fact that uh, uh, when we do experiments, they, are never, they never live in a really uh, model-free world. Okay, so what theory is doing it? I mean, Tali asked me, uh, asked me to try to tell him what the type of theory that uh, we will need in order to do research. So what theories do we need to do auditory research? Here's the auditory version of the, of the Magritte painting. Okay, it would be possible to describe everything scientifically, but it would make no sense. It would be without meaning as if you describe the Beethoven symphony as a variation of wave pressure. So what I would like, I mean, my goal, ah, by the way, do you know who this is? Uh, okay, I would like to prove that wrong. Yeah. Okay, so my point is the following. When we have sensory stimuli, we have, uh, we get the, um, we have a, a proximal stimulus. We have a sound waveform that vibrates the uh, eardrum and eventually becomes vibrations in another place in the ear and electricity and everything. Uh, but this is not what we perceive. Uh, what we, when an animal goes out in the world, when you listen to my voice, you don't hear the vibration of your body along membrane. What you hear is my voice. So in the first part of my talk, what I want to do is to push this a little bit further. Okay, the, my, at the moment, what I, the challenge I would like to pose uh, Tali, okay, is to, to give me a, a, a theory that would start with the waveform and end up with what is the meaning of that waveform for the animal that we perceive. Okay, now of course, this immediately goes out of pure auditory research, okay, because meaning the, the sound waveform by itself doesn't have any meaning, as uh, Einstein said. Okay, meaning has to do with uh, relationship in the world. So this is, again, that's an example that I like because I dislike so intensely this painting. This is Shagat, okay, the, it's called the White Crucifixion. And um, the reason that uh, this painting would strike very strongly, most of us sitting here, is uh, because of the symbolic, uh, because he uses the, the, the figures in the, in the painting in order to evoke very strong things that are not in the painting itself. Okay, so uh, uh, Jesus on the cross, uh, the salit, uh, symbolizing the Jewish person, okay, the pictures of pogroms, uh, the, the paintings of uh, the, these uh, Jews in Russian clothing, and so on and so forth. So all of that is outside the, the, the painting itself, and um, the, the painting, the meaning of the painting has to do with the fact that it concentrates all of these meanings into uh, such a, an intense uh, experience. So meaning has to do with the relationship between the sensory uh, stimuli and other stuff. Okay, and one step forward in the direction of understanding, I think a wrong step, but uh, at least a step forward, is this idea of uh, direct perception. The fact that at the level of perception, you don't perceive the proximal stimulus, but the distal world. Okay, and I want to 
He was quick, right? that I showed and I, I mean many of you already show, so I heard it. Uh, what did you hear? Sorry. What? I'm so sorry. You have to sit. No, but what did you hear? Respectful <laughs> guy. What? Respectful guy. No. <laughs> <laughs> what did you hear? <laughs> okay, people laughing. Okay, that's a... Uh, what? Okay. Chaim heard the uh, dogs barking. <laughs> How many dogs? <laughs> Male, female dogs? <laughs> okay, the point is that what happened at, at your, uh, at your uh, ear is the waveform, which has up and down and uh, changes very fast, so you can't really see the details. Um, that's a spectrogram, and frankly, I wouldn't try to, I, I can't read this spectrogram. I mean, there are people who can read spectrogram of speech, so they can look at spectrogram and tell you what, what the speech was. Okay, I don't think they would be able to, to uh, uh, read that spectrogram, although I haven't tested anyone who's really good at uh, spectrogram reading. But uh, both at the level of the waveform and at the level of the spectrogram, there are no people laughing, okay? So the people laughing is something that comes far above the, the representation of the, the, the sound itself, and it's, at least it's a presentation early in the auditory system. Okay, so here's the question. What are the auditory objects of perception? Okay, what are these things that when we start from uh, the sound waveform, uh, what are the things that we eventually deal with when we talk about the perception of the sound rather, the, rather than the, the physical, uh, um, physical waveform itself? Okay, so the problem of defining auditory objects is the problem of defining something that would take sounds and pass them into bits that make sense. Okay, and make sense again, that, that's where, what does it say? Uh, mean makes sense. So one way is to go in the direction of, uh, of uh, direct perception and say that these bits should correspond to things in the world. Okay, uh, I think that's not, in a way that's not good enough um, because of the ecology of sounds. I mean, there are too many sounds that can be emitted from all kinds of strange objects. I wanted to, yesterday my well, your daughter showed me a movie. <laughs> 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 No, we're Okay, so my point is that uh, okay, we are obviously not going to take all of these songs and attribute them to the to the actor in the movie, okay? The, the, uh, when we see this, again, there was a lot of interpretation going on, but you would, uh, uh, although the, the movie is made so that there will be some sort of illusion, <coughs> what you really do is attribute the sounds to the singer, to the famous singer, or to the non-singer, or so on, that, uh, that not to me, but that uh, these, uh, uh, that, that a reference. Okay, so auditory objects and representation of sound sources is uh, in a way that, that the definition is too weak. Now, <coughs> one direction in, in which we go in the last two years is to try to, you to uh, go with identification of auditory objects with predictive representation. So the idea 
is that you need something in the head that would allow you to predict what happens in the sensory world a bit later. And uh, if the prediction is good, you have a good representation of the world because you know how it's, uh, you, you, you know how it's, uh, 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 what, what is going on. Uh, if there are errors in the prediction, then you have to try to modify the model and then you have a lot of uh, all kinds of processing uh, that goes on in the world. May I ask a quick question yeah. here? Why not uh, post-GPT representation? It doesn't really matter. Oh, I mean, the thing is that uh, as far as I'm, I mean, the prediction. But, but it yeah. can be not, not necessarily later. Predictions about the world, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Why it's important that it's later and not later? Well, because sound, because sound. sound spatially other parts of the world? No, no, yeah, yeah, okay. This is, this is specific because sound develops in time. Okay, so uh, no, but naturally. But you want to say something about the, not the, the sensory world, not necessarily the sensory auditory world. Okay, right? okay, I should have written the auditory world. Okay. This is specifically for, uh, okay. for a different. Of course, if you talk about uh, a, a sense like vision where you have spatial relationships, that would be good too. So okay. Actually, I, I, I would argue that it's always sensor. Okay. Maybe later. Okay. No, no. Even I when I you look at, the, at an image. Okay. I agree with you. I mean, that uh, should be written here auditory if you want to do the prediction in time. Mm -hmm. I mean, prediction are also good for, for visual. Temporal prediction are also mm -hmm. good for visual, but they are certainly not the only type of prediction that we do. Okay, so uh, we have some evidence for predictive models in the auditory system. I'll show you very fast two types of, uh, uh, two types of uh, phenomena. So the first one is the type of experiment that we've been running now for over 10 years where we play a common and a rare sound, and the response to the rare sound is large, and to the common sound is, is uh, smaller. And then we do all kind of controls, like doing the, I mean, reversing the roles. So here the low frequency sound is common, and the high frequency sound is rare. And then the sound that's rare, okay, this F1 here, evoked a larger response than the same sound when it was common. Okay, and the sound that was rare here, this is F2, evoke a larger response here when it was rare than when it was common. Okay, and we can play them, uh, uh, do other controls as well. And the, the, final, uh, the final result here uh, is the fact that uh, the same sound evokes different size of responses when it comes in different uh, contexts, and the response is louder when it is rare than when it is common. Now, this requires a lot of uh, additional uh, controls. Okay, this is just a demonstration of the basic phenomenology. Okay, what, uh, these are, by the way, intracellular recordings in auditory cortex of anesthetized rats. Okay, that were collected by uh, Ty Hersenhorn in my lab. Um, and one, one attempt to explain this data uh, done in collaboration with Sally with, uh, and uh, Jonathan Rubin is to actually take this view of the world as uh, looking at the past and trying to make predictions of the future and a bit seriously. So the idea is that you use the past to construct some uh, representation. So here, for example, uh, I have a past that consists of the last five sounds in the sequence. Okay, and I have a small, uh, uh, I have a <coughs> simple model. This is for, this is a model for an animal that can't remember a lot. So in this case, it observed the past and it remembers only one of the things. Whether there were zero or one red tones, two or three red tones, or three or uh, four or five red tones. Okay, and once I have this uh, representation, I can calculate what should be the probabilities assigned to the next tone in the uh, to the next tone in the sequence, and then uh, I, and then I can uh, uh, these predict these probabilities will be used to check the prediction. Okay, so uh, the beautiful thing here is that uh, Tali can take this uh, this example and uh, actually calculate good models, okay? Good models in the sense that they balance the complexity of the model with how well it can do in, in, uh, 
in the prediction, in predicting the next round. And uh, we can take these models. Okay, so we have here the amount of sulfide, how bad the sulfide is for a specific sequence of sound and the actual response of the neuron. And we can, we can see sulfide here as a kind of prediction error. Okay, it's large when the probability of the next, that I thought the next one will be is small. And it's small when the probability that I assign to the next one is large. Okay, we can see that the responses to the same song uh, are uh, uh, related in some way to the actual, to, to this sulfide that was calculated purely on statistical uh, grounds uh, based on uh, first principles. Okay, uh, so this is one kind of prediction. Here, the sounds are running at about one per second. Okay, so I'm looking at the last, let's say, 10 seconds of the world, and I'm predicting what will happen in the next second. Uh, here's another uh, attempt to use predictive models. Here we try to account for an experiment, a human experiment. So the experiment is uh, a detection of voices over uh, other mu uh, over musical instruments. So a subject speaks, it presses a key, and it hears uh, a lot of uh, wind instruments. And from time to time, there's a voice, and when there's a voice, you have to release the key as fast as you can. Okay, and what people measure, what the people who did this experiment measure is the reaction time. So when, in blocks, when we have voices over instruments, you get one reaction time, and if we have string over uh, wind instruments, you get a longer reaction time. Okay, so there's something that, uh, uh, it looks like there's advantage for the detection of voices over uh, other musical instruments. And what these people, these people, by the way, it's uh, Daniel Pressing Fair and his group, and they call normal and Ferry, they showed that, uh, I mean, this reaction time task was done with relatively long sounds, about 100 milliseconds. But in fact, in order to uh, detect the fact that the segment is a voice and not a string instrument, you need only 8 or 16 milliseconds of sound. Okay, so what uh, Yael Bitterman did was to take all the sound that participated in this experiment and create a predictive model out of that. So what's basically what, it, what the model does is to use, uh, is that's the best linear model that would take a segment of one of these sounds and predict the next sample in the sound. Okay, so we can do that to the sound. So we have the original sound, which aids the prediction. Each sample is based on the previous real, real sample that occurred in the sound. We can compare the prediction with the actual sound. And what we find is that the predictions for voices are the worst. Okay, so these are correlation coefficients between the prediction and the actual sound. <coughs> and the voices are actually the worst. And what Yael showed is that if you just collect prediction errors, it's enough to collect prediction errors over about 10 milliseconds in order to get a significant larger errors for voices relative to string. Okay, so even at this very fast time uh, scale, a predictive model is capable of uh, uh, doing something that looks like what humans do. Okay. And it can extract the differences between voices and string instruments which was those that have been used in this experiment. Okay, so what I did was to say in a very undefined way that I want to start with a theory of meaning out of sound. Okay, and now what I'm really saying is that what I would like is to have a theory of forming predictive models on the fly from the sensory input. Okay. Uh, and these models have, in a way, to be very robust and, uh, and calculated very fast because we know that we can uh, uh, update them uh, uh, within less than 100 milliseconds under the appropriate conditions. Uh, and they must be hierarchical because I showed you that they occur at multiple time scales. Okay, or they, they, they might operate at multiple time scales, so I would like a model such, uh, like that to be able to tell me things from 10 of milliseconds which allow me to identify different uh, the, the, the voice versus instrument to the tens of seconds that are necessary in order to get the meaning of a spoken sound. Okay, and 
in the last two five minutes, I want to yeah, I want to go from here to a, the other side of the story. All I said now, everything that I was saying, it was done in a way passively in the head of the animal. But uh, what we would really like at the end is not only to have a theory that will tell you what the meaning of the sound is, but also how this meaning is extracted by brain. Okay, now here I have much less to say. Okay, yes. But when you say meaning of a sound, then, and, and it sounds like the meaning is not in the brain. The, the sound has some meaning. The sound has only meaning to you, right? And yeah. For our, for what, what do you mean expected by the brain? Or so you need this sentence mean it, it's that this is an experiment. Yeah, experimentalist. I'm an experimentalist, not a theoretician. Okay, so I know what I mean uh, in a very rough sense. Okay, <laughs> what I mean is that I have an, an environment. Okay, I, I'll say that. I mean, I'll get that to the end. Okay, I, I, I somehow. I, what I want to do, okay, is to create a situation in which sound. Okay, let me say what, let me start by what I don't want to do, okay, and then we'll get to the, okay, this is what I wanted to say too. Okay, so most sensory experiments with behaving animals look like that, okay, you select stimuli, okay, three, four, ten, in the best experiments, maybe 100, okay, you train the animal to discriminate between them, okay, then you go to, to your favorite brain region, uh, you record from enough neurons, to show that the neurons can discriminate between these sounds, and then uh, you publish, okay? <laughs> and uh, <coughs> you say that you found a neural substrate for sound discrimination, okay? Now this is obviously wrong, because the best place in the old story system to do sensory discrimination is the auditory nerves, okay? Actually, the best place to do auditory discrimination is in the loudspeaker that's outside the brain, okay? So, so in a way, the standard way of doing sensory experiments is uh, first of all trivial in the sense of what the brain has to do, and secondly, going to the wrong place in order to get the auditory, the, the, the neural responses. Okay, so this is what, this is in a way, what I think is not the way to go if you really want to understand what the auditory system does in uh, real life. Okay, so what, what do I have, yeah? I'd like to, uh, uh, to comment that I think that it's very important what kind of readout you're using. So in order, I don't know about the vision, but uh, in order to, to understand the picture, when looking at the retina, uh, or to you know, to discriminate between people and cars, when looking at the okay. picture of her in the retina, this is difficult. Reading is very complicated, but doing it in, I don't know, in IT is much easier in the sense that you may have a linear readout. Yeah, but when you ask about uh, discriminating between cars and faces, you don't talk about same stimuli, okay? You now talk about thousands of stimuli. And uh, that's a totally different question. That's a question of generalization, not a question of uh, sensory discrimination. <coughs> Okay, the, the most experiments, uh, the way that they are run, they really test discrimination between a small, I mean, with auditory system, okay, so between, between sm a small set of stimuli, not about things like uh, discriminating faces from uh, categories, okay? Categories, category uh, discrimination is a totally, totally separate uh, story, and this already approach the issue of meaning, okay? That's, uh, so your criticism about low-level Yeah, for example, keeping people laughing versus... Uh, if you test, yeah, if when you test the uh, right ability to mm -hmm. discriminate between a sequence <coughs> that uh, is five times uh, G and two times D versus a sequence that's uh, uh, seven <coughs> times uh, uh, G, okay, you are doing a simple thing, okay? That's, uh, that's a simple uh, discrimination task. The, the task itself doesn't have, it may be that uh, you want to see how information is integrated across time or how attention has to do with people, all kinds of things like that. But the sensory task itself is trivial. Okay, you don't need all the brain up to the hippocampus of the to do it. Thank you. 
perception of software sound recognition is actually is not very high. I mean, it's uh, automatic speech recognition is very bad, and uh, no, not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and if it will be better, yeah. Um, so it presumably it will encapsulate some of the signals. In order to do the same, like computer chess playing. Yeah, yeah. That's. Uh, I start to yeah, feel they're like. They're doing uh, very good, very well. I'm feeling well, a I bit like the your Rabbi Yonia kind of story. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me finish and we'll, we'll okay. go. Uh, okay. What uh, the right now. I'm not asking about how computers do it, but how I, as an experimenter, try to understand how the brain of the rat is trying to do it. Okay. But, but yeah. one thing is you know, that is too fast, and, uh, and uh, it's obviously it's more interesting to look at more complex tasks where you need maybe larger parts. But but why this has to do with you know behaving and the natural environment? <coughs> No, it doesn't have to do necessarily with behaving animals. What I said is that one of the issues that you want to do when you, when you study the brain, okay, when you study the brain, you might be able to understand how the meaning is structured in the brain. Okay. I don't have anything against uh, machines trying to, to structure No, 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 but I'm talking about, uh, about discrimination between cars and uh, airplanes extracted from the neuronal response of, let's say, an IT in a mess of IT. No, that's okay. I mean, that's what I'm doing for life today. I mean, I'm and now that's not meaning extraction, is it? It is, but uh, that's... So uh, that's uh, no, no. no. Is behaving no, but then, but then... Uh, uh, the uh, is the organism, maybe. Okay. Okay, <laughs> I still didn't you say you what I want. Say what I, 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 did, what you want I still do. didn't say what I want to okay. do. <laughs> okay. Behaving animal in a natural okay. environment. Okay. okay. So <laughs> I would like. Okay. So I would like the environment to be as natural as possible. <laughs> and, and okay. And now I will I will impose the meaning of the sound. Okay. So the idea is that uh, I would like the animals to extract. Uh, Meaning that I put uh, I put on the sound. For example, the uh, um, sounds may tell. Uh, I mean, really important information. Okay, rat is supposed to be female rat. <laughs> information is supposed to be uh, uh, important, <laughs> <laughs> but it can be artificial. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It can so, so you would not tell us anything about the extraction of meaning of sounds in any natural setting. You can combine a very artificial way sound to yeah. So I with think arbitrary association. Right. right. So what? It's so far from extraction of meaning of no, logical no. symbol. No, I think I think that it's not okay. So I'll get I'll get to that in a moment. And then we really have okay. to doubt that the word meaning but here. Okay, I, I mean the word meaning is meaningless. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Okay, and that's uh, in a way that's what I would like to achieve. Okay, 
Tas tik nav vienmēr tas ir tas, kas ir mokoši. So, I, before we take a, a break, I just want to comment that when I said that we want concepts which are measurable, and actually I think that anything which is not measurable in some sense is meaningless, I was actually very religious about it. So things like meaning, consciousness, uh, will, uh, whatever, freedom, <laughs> they're all things which, is, until you tell me how do you going to measure it, I don't know what they mean. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, therefore I don't even know how to begin to formulate uh, a prediction or a theory. Yeah, okay. So this is why in a way it's very swimming with information here, okay? So the meaning, as I said, meaning has to do with things in the outside world, okay? Not with the, not uh, with the sound itself, but with the relation between the sound and things in the, in the outside world. So uh, when I create this uh, world in which sound tell the animal things about the external world, I'm operationalizing the definition of meaning by, uh, by identifying it with information. But the world is also meaning. Okay, but I could put thing. an electrode in the VCA if you want. No, but that's trivializing. Yeah. Well, you, you define some internal chemical or electrical system and yeah. identify it as a reward and of course it's not about something else. I mean people just have to correl correlate that. Uh, okay. Yeah, but I need again as an experiment uh, I need to operationalize all the all the terms that we are using. Okay, at the end I have to manipulate something and to measure something else. Okay, so uh, the question is, to what extent this makes sense in terms of the, uh, of the question, the bigger question, which is much less well, like, well uh, defined, of in what way the auditory system is doing something for the organism in the real world. And I think that th this, this is still something that I hope to be able to make into a controlled experiment, and that it is uh, already more interesting than uh, just showing that uh, an animal can see me everything can see me like. Uh, but I mean, as you yourself said, at the end, we need these simple cases that will be the toy, sure. toy problem. No, but you know, so you uh, need the simple cases and then understand the higher level of concepts and then yeah. making the good prediction. <laughs> Can you be more concrete about this uh, roadmap? Like, give us a, 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 I mean, I'm reading these, I'm, I apologize, but I'm reading these lines and I, I, I can't form a, a simple experiment out of here. And it's my personal problem, but it would be, uh, I would like to see an example of the dream experiment where you measure everything and you can, and the animal behaves the way that it would like it to behave. Okay, so uh, the environment will tell you, uh, will be able to convey information about uh, a number of different things, for example, where a sound source is, okay, what type of food do you have there, good or bad, and uh, maybe about, uh, I don't know, how long it will be there, or something like that. And one thing that uh, comes to mind is the ability of uh, the animal to uh, actually use all of these two pieces of information efficiently when they are conveyed at the same, at the same time. So you get a kind of a sentence, okay? Good food to the left now, okay? And uh, that's, uh, so this is the kind of thing that uh, more, uh, more concretely I'm thinking as uh, as a first, uh, No, 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 I, I, I don't think so. I think that here, I mean, the thing about this experiment is that there is no right or wrong answer. There is uh, how well the animal exploits information uh, is uh, graded, uh, can be measured in a graded way. And it can do it, it can uh, completely ignore the auditory information or it can use it op optimally. Or it can do something in the middle, which would show me that it really pays attention only to one, maybe to one of the distinctions, not to others. Okay, and uh, what there's the issue.
to the practical issue of trying to measure things, but there's here the, I, I feel that the, uh, one, one of the problems that I have and that I don't know how to solve is how to measure the what's optimal behavior, and to what extent I can really uh, uh, set a limit to the performance of the animal and uh, in, in an interesting way and judge how well the animal does relative to the No, uh, the optimal, the neurons don't do optimally. The neurons do... Uh, well, they do optimally until something strange. But it's yeah, but identified. Yeah, but we had, uh, in that case, the statistical, uh, the statistical concept in which we calculated optimality was very clear. But, but you're asking about optimality of behavior. Yeah, optimality of behavior. Not of behavior. Sure, yeah. so we could not have to do it, but... Yeah. All right, I, I, I think what we want to do now, essentially, I want to actually try to hold the framework may or may not lead to some possible answers, but eventually uh, I, I want to put some uh, quantitative challenges back to the experimentalists. I mean, this is really what we want to have here. But uh, I think actually we can say a lot more about the theory of goes in the direction of whatever you want. I'm just curious, I mean, speech recognition is not an, uh, that I can today give you a computer that does better than your, your retina might in terms of understanding speech. <laughs> That's not, not, not <laughs> satisfying. <laughs> 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 Why not? I'm doing better than that. <laughs> no, no, but unlike <laughs> <I, I, I laughs> you, the computer is completely understood I mean, in some sense. I, mean, I know exactly why and how it does. Yeah, but uh, okay, my my. No, there's, there's something. Speech missing. understanding. Okay, speech understanding in the sense that uh, you're talking is like face under the face. In a way, it's categorical uh, distinction. Okay, you have a set of uh, waveforms that mean one word, and another set of waveforms that mean a different word. Okay, and uh, so it comes into the same category as space against uh, car uh, discrimination, which is highly non-trivial. Okay, but it's a sensory categorization problem. It's not meaning abstraction. The computer presumably doesn't know. Oh, I would say the uh, problem is not fast. Don't speech. use it. Don't use it to guide behavior. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you answered it, but essentially, it's not yeah. really the pattern it's recognition. Guide behavior of the world. Pa pattern okay, recognition. Okay. So at the end, you'll get something that looks like rat. I mean, that's. Uh, but again, I'm interested in the rat, not in the robot. No, no. But again, I, I just want yeah. to, yeah. to sharpen the issue yeah. and come back to yeah. it. It's not pattern recognition per se. No. It's the way it is evolved and why it is. How, how again this emergence of hierarchies? I mean, it's really the the, the, the principles that <laughs> eventually push you to a pattern recognition. It's not it's not the task of understanding words per se. Okay, well, we come back. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't have any problem with this. <laughs> no, no, I think we need a larger yeah. framework. Yeah. It's not just uh, designing yeah. a. Train a rat to recognize words. Uh, I, to train a rat to recognize words will be easy, I guess. Okay, that uh, people show that uh, rats can discriminate. Words. That's not the problem. Okay, the problem is to put these sounds again in a context in which these sounds inform the rat about uh, uh, environment in complicated ways, in ways in which, uh, uh, in uh, with, I mean, at the end when I say teach rats to understand the language, this goes beyond just identifying the words and the individual words and meaning, but also, for example, um, the ability, the, the thing that uh, one of the uh, <coughs> difficult aspects of uh, language, which is the fact that you can refer to information that's very far away, the long-range long correlation that you have in sentences between, uh, uh, between events, auditory events that occurred uh, far apart in time. Okay, so uh, that this goes now beyond the ability to identify the words themselves. I agree, but yeah. it's not, it's not yeah. so it's really in the context yeah. of behavior. Yeah, yeah.
Just a moment, Daphna, can you wait a moment and answer the question? <laughs> I'm not trying to pose uh, Let's just put it to the, the next one. I think people either want to run away or to have a break, so uh, <laughs> we will uh, take uh, to the screen. In principle, we have time until 4.30, but uh, we don't, we're not going to take it. Are serving lunch? Or <laughs> <laughs> we have, uh, we, I have another 20 minutes and then we have discussion trying to really close the loop somehow. Because otherwise, we, we will not be any point of break. Let's take a break. Oh, let's take a break. 20 minutes? No, no, no. no, no 10 no, minutes break, minutes. and then 20 minutes. <laughs> another, the second part of my talk. This one, I'm going to say with just an introduction and motivation. I actually have some interesting things. Okay,
difficult for us to really be completely original, as many of you have as many times, and, and uh, the first time we really try to do this, but together with your help, I'm sure we'll be able to formulate something interesting. So I actually want to take a, a little, one more step beyond what Elie already said about predictions as the, as the fundamental uh, theory, and, and uh, really try to somehow change the, the culture, if, if, if you can say, call it this way. I mean, so in, in principle, I would like to avoid using words which are not well-defined. Uh, I think this is uh, something which we, in, if we ever, ever managed to do this in brain science, it would be a great achievement. So for example, uh, when I use the word meaning, or when I use the, the word uh, uh, understanding even, I mean, uh, whatever, uh, of course, many other things that we use in brain science, like consciousness and free will and and uh, uh, whatever. I mean, that, the, 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 since we are talking about the brain, there is such an overload of concepts which are imposed and ill-defined that it, it's uh, getting us immediately into a mess in terms of what I consider quantitative theory. So I think, but I think the idea of prediction is is very uh, powerful. Not only it's not only very powerful because. Uh, it can be quantifiable, as I'll show you in a minute, completely. I mean, in some sense, uh, in a very precise way. But it also seems to us intuitively as, as a very powerful uh, uh, metaphor for what the brain is really trying to do. I mean, it, so in some sense, I want to, to take this idea of gathering information in the past in order to make useful predictions in the future and bring it down to a level of uh, the pendulum, <laughs> a caricature which is so simple that most of us will, will laugh at it as, as, as really a model of the brain, but, but then I may be able to actually formulate concrete and quantifiable uh, concepts with which I can form some equation, really an equation, and then, then test it uh, in experiments. It's actually, uh, Eli <coughs> more or less described an experiment like this, but I, I actually would like to argue in, 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 a, in a much more, uh, I want to take it to an extreme and see actually challenge you or challenge the experimentalist to, to find examples where this is not enough. I mean, just like saying that uh, when Newton, uh, with all the modesty required here, 
uh, formulated his, his laws and said, these are the laws of the physics of the universe. And S equal MA and the two others, and that's it. This was a, an amazingly bold step. I mean, okay, how can I say that? I mean, so of course, it took almost 200 years to really find an exception to his laws. And eventually, a coverage of this, of this, uh, of this type of uh, crisp uh, formulation of, of physics was, uh, was amazing. So in some sense, and I know it, it's, it's really uh, <laughs> completely, not only overambitious, but also ridiculous, but let's try to see if we can shrink the brain to the level of one equation, <laughs> almost one equation, uh, which will do something. And, 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 I, and I, it's not only me, of course, many people think today that uh, one of the main goals of the brain is to make predictions. And it's not just, it's really, if you, if you think about it uh, uh, long enough, you see that there's hardly anything in life that we cannot cast into some sort of gathering sensory information in order to make what we call valuable predictions. And th the only thing I I'm trying to do now is, is in, in one step, essentially, turn this into, into an equation. And I think this is a very good exercise. At least, uh, uh, so, so, what is, so, of course, the, the key here is that the brain is in some sort of interaction, what we call sensory interaction with the environment. So what Ellie called uh, sensory perception is some sort of, as far as I'm concerned, some sort of channel gathering information from the past sensory perception. And in some sense, forget everything that is not going to be useful in some valuable way in the future. And of course, they're already quantified here. So first of all, there's an environment. This environment has some sort of uh, uh, object, that, like the, the square colors here that I have to define. But this is rather easy. Mathematics, you can think about it as sound, you can think about it as images, you can think about them as, as, as a movement in the world. Like, I know how to think of the environment in a very simple caricature-like uh, think as, as what we call stochastic process over some sort of discrete variables in discrete time and so on. This is easy. I don't believe we actually lose anything in terms of describing our brain when I think about the environment in a very, very simple. And actually in most neuroscience experiments, this is precisely what we do. We actually design an environment which is so simple that it can really quantify it, like the two tones of Ellie, or like uh, playing uh, against the, I don't know, an arm bandit or something like this. I mean, very simple experiment predicting uh, coin flips, or things, things which are so simple that they're almost ridiculous, but we do this already. And not only that, when we do an experiment in neuroscience, we usually allow the brain to be in some sort of, uh, what I call equilibrium, some sort of uh, stationary flow of information in, in, in between us and between what we have to do with this information. So this is also something which you may not buy immediately. When you think about it, in the first two minutes of uh, this uh, lecture here, you, you adapted your sensory perception, you adapted your ears, you adapted your, 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 your attention, and so on. And, and from now on, you are more or less in some sort of equilibrium flow of information between me and you. I mean, you understand more or less half of what I'm saying. You got used to, the, to, to my uh, you know, uh, very poor uh, pronunciation, and so on. And, and eventually, you, you understand enough to get something out of it, what I, I argue is that this is quantifiable. There's an amount of information that I can measure that flow from you to me, and I, I'm your environment for this matter, and you can make valuable things with it, otherwise you wouldn't be here. At least I hope so. Actually, the way you do it is by essentially guessing more or less everything that I'm going to say, and you have very, so some of you have a perfect guess of what I'm going to say, and then actually look only for the surprises. Well, oh, he, he actually said something I didn't quite expect, and it happens once in a minute, maybe. And this is your value, essentially, trying to extract out of the surprises the things which are really valuable. So that to quantify, as, as, again, I want to pretend to be an engineer in the sense that everything that I want to, every concept I use here is measurable and is and quantitative. So when I say that I gather information, I have to tell you exactly what I mean by this, and I'm going to measure it. When I say that I make valuable predictions, I actually have to tell you exactly what I mean by this and, and give you an equation or a measurable device that will measure this, this prediction. And when I say that the, the prediction have value in the future, I'll actually have to tell you what I mean by this. I mean, uh, uh, in, in most sense, that has value, and this is of course difficult in general. And, and when they say that the sensory perception has costs, I also have to be very specific. So all 
have the four turns here essentially. Uh, I want to call this a perceptive, perceptive channel, I want to call this predictive channel, and associate value with my predictions and cost with my action, and that's about it. And now I want some sort of equation connects the flow. The flow. There's another quantity here, which actually turned out to be very important, and it's really how the past of the environment is related to the future of the environment. This is a slightly more tricky thing, but if you think about it, the environment around us is highly predictable in the sense that I can, you can really, despite what people say that we can't predict the future, most of the time, <laughs> most of the events in the future are highly predictable, and that's why we are here. So if, if the future was completely, totally unpredictable, we couldn't do anything. So essentially, I, I'm going to play, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been playing this game for, for some time now, and I claim that actually there is a a very elegant, a very simple set of equations that define an optimal flow of information from the past in terms of, of perception to the future in terms of prediction. And uh, it's not much more than three or four equations I can write on one page. Okay, anyway. Uh, the loop is not closed, so are you going to pair what you do with the prediction? Yeah, the loop is closed because uh, there's something which is called feedback. <laughs> Do you have anything, anything uh, better? To write the flow predictions generate actions. These actions change the incentive. So the loop is not closed in the right place. No, no, okay, you're right. So I'm already, even in, in this caricature of a brain, I already make a very simple, a very serious assumption, and I say it again for Chaim and those who didn't hear it before. <laughs> of course, he heard it many times before. But uh, I'm assuming some sort of an equilibrium. So. You're already in this flow now. I mean, you already heard me, you know what I'm going to say, and you're actually playing a game now. <laughs> that that uh, you, 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 something is changing in your brain, but nothing in terms of learning is happening here. I'm, I'm excluding learning. I'm just, you, you're, I'm talking about the situation where you have a robot that was already well trained, by the way, exactly like most of the animals in most neuroscience experiments. I mean, you, you, you train them, they don't learn anything, and die, now they react to the changes of the environment. Very good news. No, but, but I think that even, of course, we're all trying to understand learning, but, no, 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 okay, so let me be a little bit more precise. Even, of course, we're interested in the way that the brain adapts to the environment in the learning process, but we, 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 we are, I think we are in a much less, much worse shape in terms of quantifying this process. I mean, we have a lot of, I can tell you a lot about theory of learning, but what is nice about this equilibrium picture, first of all, even in your experiments, you train, measure one thing, and then do some learning, and then train, and then me measure other things, and during this measurement phase, you are mo in more or less an equilibrium. Because otherwise, because you average, all of us average. I mean, we, we average responses. We, if you don't average, I'm very happy to hear this. But most of us average responses during experiments. So in some sort, it's an equilibrium in precisely the same sense that the physical device is an equilibrium with the, with the measure, measurement apparatus. In exactly the same sense, you measure temperature, there's some sort of an equilibrium between your thermometer and, 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 and water that you, you, you measure, and so on. I mean, it, the, the notion of the equilibrium actually is very fundamental in physics, and I think it's also very fundamental in neuroscience. It's not the same type of equilibrium. It's not thermodynamic equilibrium. It's equilibrium in terms of Nothing fundamentally is changing here. It's a, it's a machine that acquires, measures information from the environment, then uses them, but nothing in terms of learning is happening here. And I'm actually very specific about it. Now, so when you say prediction, some people say, okay, perception is not about prediction. But now we know that even very basic perception, like uh, vision, making sense of this image in the sense of these gray pixels are perceived as, as, as a dog, this completely mir miraculous process, we now know that making it in a, in a bottom-up way is almost impossible. It's actually impossible computationally. Before it was shown to be impossible. But essentially what's really happening here is some sort of an hypothesis generation and testing, as, as Merak can easily tell you. So essentially we don't really see the dog, we, we hypothesize the existence of a dog, and then we actually test this hypothesis. So essentially, perception 
is active in the sense that we always guess, hypothesize about what is there, and then go back in some sort of reverse hierarchy, as, as, uh, as, as of course is well known from this picture, for example, and instead of, we don't really generate, gener in a generative way, generate the senses from bottom up to top down. So we, we first guess there is a face, or there is a tree, or there is a house. And how do we guess? Essentially, there's a prediction machine there. But eventually, that is, is generating those hypotheses. And what the, the sensory system is largely doing is actually testing this hypothesis on the lower level. So if there's a dog, there should be ears and mouth and, and whatever, some very few features that if I have a first checklist that if I check all the all, all of them, there's, there's high likelihood there's a dog. And we know that hypothesis testing is a lot more efficient than uh, generative <coughs> modeling. So this is something we learn from computer science, from pattern information. Generating hypotheses and testing them is infinitely, exponentially faster than trying to, to learn all the possible objects from the scripture. This is, it must be, there's, and this is exactly what John Tosso said in 1990 already, vision cannot work uh, bottom up. It's in no way, so this paradigm of David Marr and others cannot work. And now we know it's not only true for, for vision, it's true also for auditory perception. David Marr is bottom up. Sorry? David Marr. Yeah, to a large extent. I mean, he really said there are features, low level features that organize and put for people, fit forward today, and eventually somewhere up there, the, the high concept, the high level concept emerge. Uh, and actually, we just heard that two years ago, Tommy Poggio still saying the same thing, so I'm surprised. But most people don't, don't believe it. Uh, yes. How, how, is, how is feedback uh, and, and hypothesis te uh, uh, testing is, is uh, come you get the Z1? Or like in, in well, in maybe Barak can answer this. Uh, we know that, that you, you first perceive the high level objects and only then see the details in some sense. And the, 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 the very question is uh, how does it happen? I mean, so there must be some, some underlying mechanism which is working on the high level. And this is what I, what I meant before by. How is this hierarchy, and how is this hierarchy uh, emergent of hierarchy of concepts and, and things and, and sound as well? So of course, say uh, okay, I, I just skip this. Of course, so what, I, what I mean is that we always do this. I mean, vision is about guessing and verifying. Guessing and verifying. We can't really understand these two images, for example. Some of them, many of you have seen it. You've seen them before. At least this one. Uh, until I tell you, there's a dog, here. and then suddenly you you look for a dog and eventually find it. And that doesn't make it, uh, or if I tell you, what, what is this? And if you will look at it for a long time, until I give you some hint, and this hint will generate a prediction, and the prediction will be very good, and so on and so forth. Give, give me the hint. Pickle laughing. What is the hint? No, pickle laughing. What is the hint? <laughs> so the hint here is the uh, new back of a woman. Once you see it, you can't get rid of it. <laughs> Look, you're a grown up. <laughs> but uh, in some sense, it's actually, I don't know, you see it? You don't see it? This is the leg. This is the back. This is the, this is the head here. Crook <laughs> behind. Behind. <laughs> anyway, if you, if you don't see it now, then it come to me later. <laughs> now, uh, we know that for language, uh, this is certainly true. I mean, uh, and this is the work of Eli and Merab and others. Uh, more? Okay. <laughs> um, and ab about the reverse hierarchy in the auditory system. So this is actually kept bring us So we know that there's simply no way we can generate the word directly from the sound. There's not enough time for this. If I have to process it every millisecond of it, it's much easier to guess the word and then verify it and then check it. So Actually, we know that this is the way, this is the way uh, uh, speech recognition is done today, when it is more or less working. So you, you, there's a language model, essentially make very few predictions of the next word, and then there is a, essentially some sort of statistical pattern recognition that actually verifies. So if I guess that it's either they or they, then I, I have to look here at the onset time of the, the D and the B, and that's about it. It's a very simple thing. So. For, for speech and, and, and auditory perception, is, is even stronger evidence that prediction and, and the hypothesis testing is really the rule, not the, the exception. This is what's happening all the time. And we know it's true for music. I mean, at least we believe it's true for music. 
and it makes a lot of sense. But the point is that we don't only guess the next word, we really guess much more than this. We get, we get the, le the next sentence, which actually has a very nice idea about the next paragraph. As, as I said before, you're really pred predicting ahead of me all the time. And this active prediction of, of what I'm saying is really helping you not only to perceive, but eventually the amount of processing I have to do on the millisecond time scale is, is so, is so it's so slim that the whole thing makes a lot of sense. I can do a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things in parallel and so on. So, so it's not just words. It's much more than words. And so there's a hierarchy of, of, of objects, of what we call perceptual objects, that emerge and, al and, and allow us to, to, to really understand each other. Now, to me, this is really the key to the story. I mean, uh, how, how such hierarchies can emerge. And what is really nice is that they emerge from the same principle. If I want to make predictions about the future, I'll better think in higher levels than in, in detail. So, for example, I, I may not know exactly when, at what millisecond, the, the, the next word is going to come, but I know it should be there somewhere. Why well, I cannot tell you if uh, the sky tomorrow is going to be cloudy at 4 p.m. In, in this corner of the sky, but I may be able to say, overall, it's going to be rainy or cloudy or sunny. So this is a higher level object, a, line, a, li a higher level concept that is necessary if I want to make long-term predictions. So this is really, really a, a very, very fundamental thing. Predictions and hierarchies <laughs> are very nicely tied to each other. If you want to extend your, what I call, predictive horizon, see more into the future, you, you are forced to, what Merab calls, chunk your object into higher level objects. So the hierarchies and, and, the, and, the, and the predictions, and the same sense about the past, by the way, you don't have to remember everything in the past, you have to make only a few things which really are enough to make good predictions. And again, a piece of mathematics that we understand pretty well now, and, and that if the environment is really more or less stochastic uh, and stationary, then the amount of things in the past which are really valuable in the future, which has any mutual information with the future, whatever mutual information means at this point, is slim, it's very, very small. Most of the things in the past are irrelevant in terms of prediction, and most of the things in the future are irrelevant with respect to the past, are unpredictable. So light is essentially some sort of serving over that is predictive part of the environment. By the way, if you're asking me, this is what saves us, because uh, we couldn't cope. I mean, we don't have enough processing power, enough brain uh, to actually remember everything around us. It's too complicated. And that's because only a very tiny part of it is really important, even flies or, or, or even simpler and more of simple creatures can, can cope with very complex environments because they don't need most of the things that happen. Okay, so language, as far as I'm concerned, is really a window, a very important window to the understanding of how we generate this hierarchy. And that's why I encourage everybody to think about language perception and the emergence of language. So it's not just sound, because there's something funny or interesting about language. It's not just for communication, as we usually think. It's really mostly, I think, for conceptualizing the important things in the world. And, and uh, we know now, I'll just show you a few, a few, a few uh, nice examples, that language is an extremely regular phenomenon in, in statistics. So, so those words that emerge in language seem to obey, seem to obey some very simple uh, uh, statistical laws. Uh, it's, uh, it's not something that linguists li like in most cases. That's why Al is not here at the podium. So not <laughs> really like it, but because it, it goes against the nature of language as something as a God-given phenomena that we are forced to. <laughs> we must use this way, and there's grammar and syntax. If you violate the rules, you are going to be punished, and so on. It actually works much more as language as some sort of an adaptive mechanism that's changing all the time. That really allows us to cope with new things in the environment. So I'll just go show you. Two fascinating facts, which are known to uh, a lot of people, but are not, uh, not, not emphasized enough. So first of all, if I ask you how many words are in, in, let's say, Hebrew or English, I'm sure that those who never heard it before will come up with some numbers. Right? <laughs> Two million, 100,000, 1,000, whatever. So how many words do you think there are in, in English? Then? 50, 000, 000. How many? 50,000. 50, if you take the Oxford Dictionary, there are about two million words there. So it's Why 50,000? I don't know. I mean, it, it, so it, there's something arbitrary in whatever you say. And indeed, if you just try to measure it, again, just look at 
something very simple. I'm sorry for this Hebrew. Uh, most of you can read it, I suppose. <laughs> if you just look at the number of words, I just look at a very long text, let's say news in the internet, and I simply count. Whenever I, I see a word, so a word can be defined almost arbitrarily, let's say anything which is separated by spaces or punctuation, and really doesn't matter how you define it, with the morphology, without the morphology, this is not going to change much the story. And you simply count the number of words, and here, whenever you see something new, a new string that didn't appear before, you, you increase this counter by one. And what you see is something like this. And here we did it up to whatever, one million words, but, or, or 5,000. You can actually continue it to 100 million, and it seems to go, grow and not saturate. So if you don't believe me, this is actually not my imagination. You put it in log log plot, and in log log plot, it looks perfect, like a perfect straight line, which means that the whole thing more or less grows like uh, something like a power 0.64, which means uh, a little more than a square root. Okay. Is it natural log? Natural? No, it doesn't matter. Or, or, or log base 2 or what? It's log base whatever. It's just a little change on the offset. Tends to the same, same, to the same, same, same word? <laughs> no, it's, it's natural. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Tends to the 9. No. No, no, okay. It's, not, it's log, it's natural log, yes. Natural. Even log 2, whatever. And I'm not sure. I mean, this is something done by uh, one of my students a long time ago. I never checked the number exactly. And what is this? No, but you know, the, but, but the history of the humankind is, is uh, you cannot continue to do No, no, but you have a billion words. Take only the news in, uh, in, uh, in no, the we have. The y-axis. What is the y-axis? The y-axis is, is the, the, rate of the log of, of the number of, of words. It's also log. It's the log of this number, okay? So mm -hmm. it's probably log two. Eight is about 6,000. Anyway, so uh, essentially what is really important is not the constant, which may depend on many other things, like the morphology, or, but the exponent. <coughs> and it, so it turns out that many languages, and I can show you things for English and for Hebrew and for uh, Korean and for whatever you want, actually we did it for something like 20 different languages, they all seem to obey this very simple scaling law. The number of different words grows like a little less le sublinear, it's a le little less than one, and usually a little more than one half. And this is a very regular phenomenon, which means that the number of words in a language is a meaningful quantity, in meaning meaningless quantity in the in standard sense. <laughs> meaningless in the sense it's not well defined. It depends on it's growing all the time. So you can think about many statistical models that will behave like this. For example, if you do some sort of a constrained random walk, so that this is one basic fact about language. I mean, words are generated all the time in any language. As long as you use it, you generate new words. Okay, strange, but very, very, very systematic and very regular. And of course, it, 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 it links perfectly with the idea that words are generated when we encounter new things and we have to give them a new name. And if the environment is really stochastic and we always change our environment, so there's always new things that are going to show up there. There's another... I skip this. I skip this slide. There's a, there are two others. Some of you who heard the stationarity in some sense, right? The environment of rationality. Stationarity. Uh, I mean, there's always growth. Of because the world cannot be deleted. It's not really against stationarity. I'll tell you in a minute like why not. I mean, if you, if you, uh, <coughs> there's two other laws that I have to mention here. I think we skip this for some reason. One is, is actually known, very famous and completely irrelevant, known as this law. So maybe many of you have heard about it. If you actually look at uh, the distribution of words, uh, this is something which was discovered in the 30s by this German guy, uh, Zip, I don't remember his surname. Uh, he, he actually realized that if you, if you plot uh, the, the number of words that occur in the text only once, and then the number of words that occur on in, the, in a text only twice, and then the one number of words occurred only three times, and so on and so forth, for any corpus, and then you plot, this is what you call the, okay, so how many words appeared once? How many, this is called the rank of the words, and, and frequency of the words, and then uh, he simply ranked them, I mean, took uh, the, the, this column, the histogram, and, and plotted it in a log-log plot. It's kind of strange, but you think about it, and then you, got, you get really something very similar to what I have here, this is something I did, but uh, not on a very large data, what seems to me, again, it's a log rank versus log frequency, as we usually call it. 
and the frequency is the number of occurrences, uh, and the rank is where did it appear in this list of words, and that's more or less a uh, one over a slope minus one, or one over s, or many other. And now those of you who know a little bit about scaling laws, this is a very natural mm -hmm. thing if you have invariance to, to units. Uh, one is one over one over s law. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a triviality in the sense that it happens on also for things like uh, lengths of rivers or populations of cities or whatever. If you plot how many cities are between 10 and 10,000, how many cities are between 10,000 100, 100,000, and so on, and you plot this long, long frequency, you get a scaling law of, one, of minus one. And it's actually not that difficult to explain. It is simply a, a reflection of invariance to, to, to the units, as I mentioned. How, why is it exactly true for language? It requires some more explanation. But this is, this is very famous statistic. What is really interesting about it is another reflection of the fact that words appear all the time. No matter how, how many, uh, what is the size of your text, most of the words, or the largest frequency is one. The most frequent frequency of words appears only once in the text. Which means that there are many, many words that appear only once, and that's it, no matter how large the text is. And, 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 and uh, actually, and we discovered another law explain in a minute, which is actually much more interesting as far as I'm concerned, which is that if you look at the meaningful aspect of words, which is really, um, so here yeah, I'm actually plot, plotting something very similar to what Ellie did before, and believe me, without getting into too many details, I'm, I'm certain about it, how we, how we actually measure it, but this is, a, this is an empirical curve. When we measure it, this is something which we first encountered it in the work of uh, Noam Slonim, and then and then uh, with many other students, we verify this for many other languages and so on. And what we see here is the complexity of the semantics. I mean, how many words are there measured in this funny unit of information? So think about it as the entropy of the language in some sense, uh, of the lexicon. And, and that's, this is the accuracy. How, how, how much this, this lexicon is enabled to, to give precise meaning to things? And the way we measure it is by labeling a document, as by telling you what is it about. And, and we did it for many, many documents, and then compressed essentially the lexicon from very, very few words to very, very to the full number of words in a systematic way, which has to do with this information theoretic trade do. So this is a description of the data, it's not a description of my algorithm. And this curve is a property of language. And what's interesting about this curve is that it seems to, 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 to be extremely regular. And these two things are some preliminary attempts to measure it with some rough algorithms, and this is actual bounds, mathematical bounds, that can calculate analytical models from this data. And again, if you look at this as a log log plot, and some, perhaps a little, just revert it and then plot it in log log plot, you get in a perfect straight line with a slope which is extremely close to. Again, we did it then with Dmitry Davidov actually for about uh, 20 other languages, and uh, we always find the same law. And again, what does this mean? It means that words are generated in some sort of systematic manner. Uh, we split words or we create a new word whenever there's a need for it, in some sense, in, in a very systematic, regular way. Now, this type of regularities in language, to me, as, as uh, somebody who thinks of, of himself as a theorist, uh, theoretician, uh, uh, is, is a good, indi a strong indication that actually this phenomenon of generating new words is, is extremely, ex it's governed by some simple laws. So it's, it's not that complicated. And, uh, and, and, then, and actually, if you know, power laws like this usually are usually a reflection of some, what you call self-similar process, something, something underneath repeats itself on different scales. And, and if you think about the brain again, this is a strong indication that this hierarchy of, of chunks and objects that we mentioned before, something repeats itself on different scales in exactly the same way. And, uh, and indeed, uh, when, uh, so there's some, uh, if, if we think about it in terms of prediction, so if, if our, our core organism is simply trying to make sense of the future with respect to, so of the past, with respect to some future, and what this creature now has to do is to, to chunk or to cluster or to, to put together objects in the past of the environment that will be predictive. But now I, I, I'm making his life more and more complicated. I, I'm forcing it to use more and more paths and to, to generate higher and higher 
more and more complex representation. Think about it. This is precisely what we do with language. The words in language are simply names to objects that we care about. In some sense, it's not only objects, but also processes, and there are different types of words and different types of nouns. But this is, these are all details. And again, so I can take this, these observations uh, about language, empirical observation, and cast them into this very simple theory. Without telling you too many details again how I do it, I can calculate analytically. You give me the statistical environment, and I'll give you what is the optimal trade-off between complexity and accuracy in terms of predicting the future. And usually, we always get curves like this. I mean, so they, they have this law of diminishing returns, which means that I usually start with a finite slope, which is an interesting phenomenon on its own. And then, at some, up to some linear growth, I start to curve up. And of course, if the process that I'm trying to capture is very, very easy, then with very few bits of complexity, I can capture most of the structure, which means that I go up, up very high. But if it has some regular, regular complexity, which always emerges like language, this will be more and more like a parallel, which means uh, like a parabola or something like this. And of course, this has to do with what Ellie mentioned before about the, the complexity of the representation, the sound of the whatever it is. And the nice thing about this type of pictures is that Everything here is not only well defined, but very easy to calculate. Especially the three quantities again. How much information you gather from the environment, how much information you need to use in the future. And of course, this is not simply information, but it's valuable information just to make fine happy. I mean, it's not, not every bit about the future is useful, of course. And we know how to trade the game between value and, and information, but, uh, but this is, uh, these are all details. So what is really nice about, about this type of story now you have a, a meta theory that can allows you to talk about conceptual uh, about perceptual hierarchies in a much more precise way. So here's a, a recent example done done by uh, by, uh, by Nori Nori Jacobi using some some uh, some uh, new new uh, way of formulating this uh, this principle using kernels, which makes it completely tractable from a lot of problems. And you can take a picture like this. Very famous and very nice. And the Shire Knight of Van Gogh. And you, and you can ask yourself, okay, what are, let's say that I want to do to this picture what I did to language in some sense. I want to, to remove information perceptually without losing meaning. Now, in this case, meaning was very simple. So, no, you chose simply the colors. Because, fortunately, this picture is, is very, not only colorful, but the colors are well, well localized in some sense. So, there's this tree, which is dark, and there's a, Sun here, or the star, whatever it is, and, and uh, everything. So essentially, you, you can I, you can I, you can now play this this coarsening game, and eventually generate a curve that tells you uh, essentially at every point on this curve what is the level of the, you, can, you see that you can compress it uh, very significantly in terms of uh, in terms of the bits that you actually need to remember and preserve some of it in, t in terms of the location of the colors and generate all sorts of nice pictures on the way. So, and of course, this is just an illustration. It's not that uh, it's too seriously. What is really nice about this algorithm is that you can, now you can run it actually on everything. And you can apply this principle of complexity versus uh, accuracy. And, and here you can, you can show that uh, if, you, if you choose your localized kernels, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the localized sensors, what are the things that you really care about in your low-level vision in this case, you get different curves like this, which means that, so this is a, some sort of a linear, linear perception or a linear Gaussian model, which really gives you very different information. And eventually, you can increase the complexity forever without really getting any, any, anything, anything new. But if you, if you move to more localized features, you get more, more and more efficient, efficient uh, accumulation of information. And of course, eventually, there's some sort of an asymptotic value, which is the best you can do with any feature. And this is really the, the, the best description of this, of this uh, image. So, so here is a, here is a systematic way to generate this graceful trade-off between complexity and accuracy in a way which depends only on the data. OK, so now we have this, uh, this nice uh, scaling information in the world. In the world and, and now I, I can really start to pose those challenges to the experimentalists. First of all, I think understanding the hierarchy on, some, on, on first principles is something we, okay, this is, this is just a collection of the curves of different languages, but essentially what we're saying here 
can be summarized by this uh, nice uh, picture. I'm looking better than this. Imagine that our perception is really always in time. So that's why I, 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 I borrow the temporal aspect. Even when we see, of course, it's true when we see a movie, but even when I see a picture, I do some sort of a scan. And I move from, from important things to less important things. I have, I have a temporal process of predicting more and more details, even when I look at an image of Van Gogh. So although time is not explicit there, but I, I argue this is almost obvious, and actually, it's again, it can be grounded on very solid mathematics, that our perception of time and space is very non-uniform. I call it the time fisheye. Essentially, think about going far into the past or far into the future, we have this uh, curvy, curvy space. The resolution in short, term, in short times is very high. And uh, when, when we go further up, both in space and time, uh, essentially, we have much less information. And, this, and of course, the, the amount of information that we have in our future is determined only by the statistical properties of the environment. It's not, it's not something which we have to invent. And the fact that I have what I call predictive horizon, uh, uh, so I can say more about the next minute, I can say a little less about the next hour, I can say much less about the next 10 hours, and so on. Essentially, at least for simple words, it really grows logarithmically, and this is also a mathematical theorem. Essentially, so my perception of information in terms of the number of bits that I really know about the next day is the same at more or less as the number of bits I have about the next year, and so on. And, uh, oh, the, the day is, is very detailed, and the next, then the week is less detailed, and so on. So we have this curved information, curve, uh, information structure. And if you think about time as something which is perceived by, by information, our perception of time is not real time, but some sort of information time, then a lot of things, this is of course an, a theoretical hypothesis that I would like to test, and that I would like to challenge you with an experiment to test it. But if, if this is true, then many things make sense. And then I, I, I know exactly how these chunks of hierarchy, both in visual perception, and in, in, in temporal perception, and in, in acoustic perception, can be formed. They're simply, these are the only things that allow me to make further up prediction or, or long-term predictions, or use the history in, in a sensible way without exploding my memory with nonsense. Essentially, in order to really think about the future, which I think is what makes us intelligent and planning ahead, uh, thinking about the future in detail, I need to form new concepts. I cannot speak in, uh, about the future in the same resolution that I speak about the far future as I speak about the near future. Right? By the way, this is, this is something which comes also from the algor algorithms for planning. I mean, those of you who know something about how do we plan, so we saw something like the Bellman equation or things like this. If I don't chunk the state, then the whole thing becomes intractable. But if I do this type of chunking the future, then things become uh, easier and tractable and it's very nice. So what I claim is that the whole thing, the hierarchies, the, 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 the hierarchy of perception, essentially seem all to be followed from this single principle. You want to optimize your, the, the, your memories for making the most useful prediction about it. So that's it. Now, this is a little bit too much, but right here are experiments that I want to suggest to Ellie and to others, and, and that's more or less where I want to stop. So first of all, I want to understand the neural origins of what we call this regular hierarchy. And, and, and so I showed you some example of regular hierarchies in, in language. And actually, I simply don't work in vision, but, but the more I look at vision, I see the same phenomenon again and again. You didn't mention even what a hierarchy in language. No, it's, I, I don't think yeah. so. The hierarchies in language are obvious. I mean, so you have phonemes, you have words, okay, you have, you didn't, you have you sentences. Didn't, you didn't show I didn't show that. No, I didn't show that. What I showed you is, is, is some sort of reflection of scale. Uh, but, okay, you're right. I mean, I think we didn't have time to talk about this. Uh, I mean, we had time. I did have time to get into this. No, no, you didn't need anything. What, what I just said that because uh, if, if you just take this hypothesis, our, our perception is scaled with information of this kind, then I need to give new words to the same amount of information in the future, which means that I'll, I'll need a new concept to describe the to tomorrow, let's say next week. Or, or, or again, I, this is influence, influence of Merab and Eli that talk to me too much, but in, in principle I need to, to group together things which I simply cannot specify. And this will emerge, which is generating hierarchy. So a hierarchy is, is the natural, and I, I actually I claim is the only way of really generating a useful code of, of the future if you have a full resolution of the far future. So this is 
a very natural uh, uh, property from this, what, what, what I call the gestalt. So the gestalt is exactly what happened to you in, with this image of the woman. I mean, uh, you, some, somehow the, the, the details disappeared and you saw something bigger than that. This was an image of something hierarchy, some hierarchy, so I say it's a perceptual, it's a visual perceptual hierarchy. But by the way, I just real, I realized only <laughs> recently that there are people who can't do it. I mean, who are really impaired in terms of their gestalt abilities. And, 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 uh, and then you can tell them forever that there's a woman, they'll never see it. Or, 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 and then semi true by the way, about auditory perception. There are people, there's some sort of an impairment, I wrote it somewhere here. There are people who cannot, who have disabilities in, in, in mentalization or in, or in grouping things together. And I think it, it's, a cha it's a very fascinating subject for people who are interested in learning and, and their cognitive disabilities to really identify what's wrong in the brain of this is that cannot move to the higher level in the art. You don't see the gestalt or don't hear the gestalt. I mean, some people in music, I mean, in the brain and music course that uh, Ellen and I are, and others are teaching, uh, we, we actually have uh, examples of the hierarchy of structures, but, but I know that there are a lot of people who don't hear it. I mean, who cannot go beyond the rhythm or do, cannot go beyond the, the simple melody and then see that there's actually a higher structure there things appear, it's again, it's not obvious that it's there, but it's there. Of course, this is what, and again, so, which means in, in my language, it's going higher on this curve and, and doing this refinement. So this curve, again, I, I don't want to, to overload you with information theoretic concept, but moving on this curve is essentially completely equivalent to hierarchy, so it's called a finer and finer curve. Now, um, so the, the experiment that I'm going to challenge, so first of all, the emergence of auditory Turkish this is something which, which I think Ellie is actually talking about. I mean, how do you make sense of uh, simple sounds in terms of, uh, of larger objects? And, and, and uh, uh, so where, where is this transition happening? I mean, the, the suddenly you hear the word and not just the, the bits of the sound. Or, or, or suddenly you hear the piece. <laughs> suddenly you have this, uh, this uh, higher level uh, uh, elementalization. Uh, Conceptualization, whatever you want to call it, and, and it's not a, it's not a coincidence. That I cause I think that this emergence of stuff of higher level, higher level concept is is also identical to the way we we supposed to do theory in science. Concept uh, see the higher level again, understand it in, the, in new terms. Uh, it has actually to do with the neural code. But again, I, I just this is also not all of you. May, maybe not all of you are aware of the long long dilemma of the nature of the neural code. So this is one of those things that, after thinking about it for quite a few years, I believe it, it, it's what some people call red herring. I mean, the neural code should be such that it should repeat itself on different scales. Uh, and this, is, this, is by, this by itself is almost imposing the structure of it. In the sense that it cannot, neurons should, should allow us to, the same neuron should be able to capture fine details and large details without changing the code. And uh, without changing the, the fundamental nature of the concept, the weight of the, so something in this code should be invariant to the scale of your phenomena, and this by itself imposing a lot of the, uh, one, one aspect of it, uh, it, it puts all this, uh, all this argument of uh, precise timing in an entirely different light. But anyway, understanding the neural code, uh, and this is something which I find uh, extremely challenging, but of course this by itself is not a specific experiment. But again, if you look at this thing that uh, Ellie measured with Nahum, and we now reinterpret, we didn't show you the details, but, but there are spikes there, and these spikes seem to encode surprise. So this is very funny to think about it, because surprise to what? I mean, so, of course, the assumption here, in, in this very simple experiment, it was surprise to the next tone, based on nothing else, because there was really no structure in this data beyond that. It's an IAD sequence of tones. But imagine now, and he's actually playing, I was hoping that he would tell you more about it, but in, maybe in the music course, he's actually playing a lot more complex things to, to mice, like the ligati and who knows what. And eventually he will play them Brahms and, uh, and uh, I don't know, <laughs> jazz. But, it, but what, what is really nice about higher level music, just like higher level language, is that the surprise happens on larger and larger facets. We were doing some experiments like this with uh, Adar and uh, Iran, uh, Iran, uh, Iran, uh, Iran uh, what's his last name? Hmm? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, 
from uh, Tel Aviv uh, with code. I mean, we just try to see surprise in harmony and so on. So we know that there is a higher, higher and higher structure. But if this is true, the fact that we see neurons responding to surprise should be universal. It should be to any surprise. It means that what the, the receptive field of the neuron depends on the, the pre-processing on the number and not on the actual firing of the neuron. So this is to me some sort of a paradigm in the thought itself. That we think a neural code is really just encoding surprise. The question is, surprise to what? And the fact that so many neurons, actually, we found that in the auditory cortex, 50% uh, of the neuron you measure, actually any neuron that you measure, any neuron that you measure, okay, far better than that. It, it, it seems to encode surprise to the same sound, and of course it will encode surprise to much larger objects once the, the larger objects are perceived. So in some sense to me, this is the, the, the ultimate answer to the neural code dilemma. There's no code. There's firing which reflects log probability of events conditioned on past, and what is this past depends on how complex is your perceptive, perceptive apparatus. The question is how to turn this into an experiment. Essentially, the experiment is very simple. It's essentially, what it is already doing, play mice much more complex sound streams and see if they are surprised by what we call surprise in higher and higher, higher, higher on this hierarchy. I mean, when you go higher and higher on this curve of surprise. Okay, so uh, this is this this is what we call the one second, sorry, but the perception refinement. Never mind. So, uh, in my opinion, all this list of uh, gestalt and hierarchies experiments are one one class of experiments I really would like to see. Uh, and the, the other one is this challenge, which I really don't know how to do it, is how to measure directly the this distortion of time. So I don't know. This is really a challenge. I, I, I thought about it uh, not that long. But uh, the fact that, uh, first of all, is there a way, and I'm asking, I don't know, the cognitive scientists here, or the cognitive psychologists, or the, how can we verify that you are really reacting to something which corresponds to what I call the same amount of information about the future? Uh, how to identify those uh, chunks in some systematic way? So I have a, 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 a computational mechanism for generating chunk given an environment. How do, you, how do you test that this is really what the animal responds to? So, for example, one type of experiment I would like to see is to take those uh, chunks and put them in the context of surprising more or less, and then if indeed the animal, or the human for that matter, responds to this chunk, I'm, I'm going to measure surprise when, I, when it's absent or, 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 or abandoned or whatever. And again, this is a big challenge that uh, is interesting. I'm, I'm very interested in how, how, how are all these... Uh, hierarchy impairment, I call them, uh, related to what we call learning disorders. <coughs> I believe that there are strong connections. For, for example, I'm quite sure that people with ADD, uh, which are everywhere, you know, uh, uh, have some, some impairment in terms of planning ahead, I mean, <laughs> in terms of thinking about the future. Or, or maybe they know how to plan, but they definitely know how to follow this, you know. So uh, at least they, have, they need some help with it. And, and this, this, in my opinion, has to do with some sort of, uh, of uh, uh, overload or, or under uh, overload of information, maybe, or, or some other things that that prevent the cycle, to the hierarchy of the cycles of information, to flow as, as as we know as we know, so as we want. In some sense, there's some sort of cutoff on the on the on the short on the long-term planning, which I believe has to do maybe with with the dopamine edge mechanism or something else. I don't, of course, if you really believe that we understand ADD, it's because dopamine something has something to do with it. But the other problem that I, uh, is also another disability that, that I, f I find fascinating is, is, is has to do with, again, with the absence of gestalt, this, what they call mentalization. The, the fact that you don't really see, you see the details, but you have, you, you have problems seeing the big picture. It's, 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 uh, it's known now, and it's somet sometimes it, it, it appears as, as a communication disorder, sometimes it appears as uh, other things. But it's, it's, it's something which I find fascinating. I think uh, people should think about those disabilities in light of such a theory and see if it makes sense. Okay, that's all I want to say. And um, in principle, we have uh, 10 more minutes, because <laughs> uh, the seminar is going to be very soon. <laughs> If you have questions or comments or complaints, this is fine. Two more questions. Okay.
Okay, so, so we got to this slide. The, you, most of what you say here is not really, I cannot really uh, translate them to, to complete experiment except for one, which is uh, the prediction or the, to test the hypothesis that uh, a single neuron will be sensitive to larger and larger objects. Uh, so that's a complete experiment. I think the answer would be no, but uh, not in every place in the brain you will have it. Uh, but that's a complete experiment to, 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 to measure. But uh, the rest is uh, a measure of what it told you start. Well, that's, that's a lifelong uh, no, no, of course. No, I, 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 so it's not, it's not complete experiment. If I had the really complete experiment, then you know the answer, basically. I would do it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. So, no, but so I, I think I, the I, challenge... Starting a discussion. I, don't know. I know, but I, I'm just saying that the general, the general uh, I think part of the uh, we can counter here is to raise more basic fundamental questions and part of it to see whether one can actually extract from this uh, world views that theoreticians have concrete experiments to have. And I agree. And and I, I I I'm well aware of the fact that this is too, uh, too big. But the fact that you actually identified one experiment here is also <laughs> already more than I expected. <coughs> the interaction between Tali and me regarding this thing really started because we found uh, a thing that looked like Kozilov uh, profile relatively early in the evolutionary system. Yeah, no, I, yeah, then, but, uh, but there was, uh, looking into the future, uh, Tali suggested. Yeah. So now, now we play, yeah, so we play music to the, to the Rex and uh, we have uh, the on the surface results that need to be very well uh, controlled uh, in a way showing chances. We like when we particularly like to emphasize the mutants that we find that they may not have the same response and they have very uh, nice responses to surprises. But if cells represent only surprises, which is what you suggested, how would you say that they respond to the same stimulus all the time? Namely, they, they pose for minimum surprise? No. Okay. Well, that's a good question. Uh, so that's this is the easy one. <laughs> No, but I, I think I, I answered it. What I'm saying, this is by, by, by making this distinction between learning and, and behaving after adaptation. So what I'm saying is that if you believe this frame, this is the separation of the equilibrium flow of information from the learning phase. So what I'm saying is that most of us don't really learn all their life, and it's not true. We, we behave, we react to new, to new things all the time, but we use the same mechanism more or less. It's a very slow adaptation beyond that point. And then, you know, just like we enjoy the same piece of music even if you play it 10,000 times, by the way, I actually argue that you don't hear the same piece of music 10,000 times because you slowly climb on this curve of complexity and always hear new things there. But in principle, we can enjoy many things and forget it. I mean, don't internalize the new structure. And okay, so we are limited. I mean, we don't really learn all that. The answer is that... About, the question was about coding, not yeah. about learning. Well, ah, okay. so, so five accounts for some substantial of the variability of the responses of the neurons and stimuli. The meta surprising thing is the fact that the surprise accounts for a lot of the variability, but not for all of it. So, for example, the neurons in auditory cortex are still prone to frequency. They respond to some pure tones and they don't respond to other pure tones. Other fields on uh, frequency, but the thing is uh, constrained about 
top of the variability has to do with the surprise. Okay, so that's, uh, they still, they still call other things as well, not only the surprise. I don't know. I, I think that's, that's a different the, the, This is the, the, the experimental of the experimental. Do you think Oshi disagree with the experimental? No, no, I, I think we agree. Just, uh, you, you asked the question, why is it that we repeated, repeatedly respond to the yeah, same signal, so even that we are not surprised? You, you repeated it so strongly that no one was only encoded the surprise. Well, first of all, it's, it's a very, it's a very coarse, rough encoder of surprise. Surprise conditioned on, on some complexity of representation. And what we see, at least in Ellie's anesthetized case, for those that we actually measure, that they don't improve their representation beyond a certain limit and stay there. And but there but when I see <coughs> the, same of the same stimulus again and again, every time I'm surprised because uh, maybe the prior read that there will not be a stimulus. Yes, so so no, what is surprise? No, of course. So it's, uh, you're right. And that's something that we have to eventually, if we want to have a theory of everything, then uh, we'll have to resolve. So if you play your stimuli once every 10 seconds, you can get a strong response almost independently of what the stimulus is. Okay, when you play the stimuli every 300 milliseconds, this probability is that and that, okay, and then you can ask what the, why the neuron responds now a lot and, and the different time uh, only a little bit, and that would be related to the surprise that occurs during that sequence, okay, at, uh, on a time scale of uh, two tens of seconds. Okay, the, we, we cannot use, at the moment, we cannot use this theory to account for everything that we see in the in no, I mean, a good experiment, actually violating the theory is even more challenging to me than uh, confirming it. I mean, show me things which are not like this. Well, no, you showed you already. Well, there, uh, are, but there <laughs> are things that are like this, but there are many things that are not like this. You showed <laughs> like this. What do you mean? Oh. Repeated exposure. No, the fact that, the the fact that the a monkey responds Maybe we're taking to an extreme. Right? So first of all, th there are two ways to around it. One, maybe it is surprised to think that you didn't measure I mean, other things that happened there. But if I believe Ellie, I don't know, I just quote him. This 50% variability, <laughs> variability is almost completely Poissonian. Actually, I don't think it's true. Well, I mean, it's a response to the same no. problem. No, 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 it's not <laughs> I completely agree with you that this simple experiment uh, cannot account for everything. I can just, but this is not violating the principle. It's violating this particular statement. Design the principle. Tell me the principle, the principle and then we'll start. The principle is very simple. <laughs> the brain is sitting on this curve at some level of complexity. If you allow it to adapt well yeah. enough, and the curve is, is analytically calculated by an optimal trade-off between information from the past and information about the future. That's it. Subject to value subject to reward that you can, but that's it, it's a very simple thing. It's too simple okay. to be uh, Okay, so may, may I go to the hard question, because maybe some other people need to be able to I think some came from the Society for Neuroscience meeting, and they were lecture about neuroeconomic effects. And the thing he most uh, strongly tried to prove is that our prediction sucks. <laughs> So first of all, I, I think that the, the term prediction is, not, prediction is not well defined. Prediction. Most of the time we actually make very good predictions. Of course, we are not very good at predicting the really surprising things. But those are so rare you that you don't really care about it. Because no, no, it's random. I don't think it's true. Because it's random. No, I don't think it's true. I mean, uh, that's like saying that you can't predict the future. Okay. Most of the time we actually make very, make very, good, very good predictions. Thank you. 
like the kind of participation you see is very dissenters and you find intervals. Uh, the kind of position you see at the level of neuro and biological reporting is very dissenters and the time intervals that were existed in the sounds, but uh, which is not consistent with my conceptual ability to predict sounds. So I mean, if you want to see fast adaptation, you do tap, 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 and you see something very fast, but if you tap, No, we have decay of memory. That, that's what is. I mean, obviously, we don't remember everything in the same way forever. So, but but uh, so this would be some sort of fatigue, and that's but also the memory decay. But if you exactly when the next tone will be presented, that are particularly accurate tones <laughs> with a very different time scale than any kind of adaptation you see within the same neural network or corpus. Sorry, I can well well predict the sun the sunrise in the scale of 24 hours. But my, my, my photoreceptors and my retina is surprised every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really surprised? <laughs> <laughs> well, to a large degree. I mean, of course, uh, I mean, there is development, there is maturation, and there are adaptations on scale, but it's... It so, again, at least it's also the context we can get as long as two minutes. And I think, I mean, I, I would like to be true. I will show you the data. Uh, it's not... Uh, adapted version of this piece of music. Musical Ipercata, number two. It has basically three notes. Okay? There's an E sharp, F sharp, and here, at this part of the piece, you have a third note appearing, a G. Okay? So you have a context that's created by playing this E sharp and F sharp at the beginning, and then you have this surprising note, which is a G. It's just a semitone away from the, from the context. Okay, G, 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 here they play together, and then uh, the third context uh, reappears. Okay, so that's... Uh, okay, now this, this is, it's a very rough representation. These are average of a lot of units from the auditory cortex of red uh, responding to these sounds. So this is the context. This is where the G first appeared, and here you have a, a moment in the piece where the G and the E sharp and F sharp are playing together, all of them loud. Uh, these are the time, the moments in time in which they're responsive. They're all locked to the time of, of the event here. And basically, most of these responses come from, the, from this surprising G. Okay, so here the adaptation occurred over a time scale of about two minutes. Okay, and after that, a very small <coughs> change in the the physics, just to move the on away, make the neurons in the red auditory cortex react uh, quite a lot. That's not 24 hours, I agree. Okay? But this is only the time scales that are relevant for uh, results. Okay, that's not a model. Tantalizing possibilities to let really understand the <laughs> Anyway, I want to thank you all for your patience, and I hope uh, that the <laughs> I'm sure that the next the next uh, couples will do much better. Mm -hmm. <laughs>